Andra Fissilodes, aka Blue Fissilis, as I know it. I first saw this plant in Switzerland, actually, at a community garden, and usually there people call it Blue Fissilis, or Blaue Fissilis. It has some other names. Apple of Peru is a common one. So right there you think like, oh, you can eat it. Uh, shoe fly plant, interesting. And another name for it is poisonberry. What the? I'm hoping there's some intrigue already seeping through. Blue Fissilis is a herbaceous annual, but a lot of people consider it a weed. Um, it tends to just kind of volunteer grow or pop up from natural self-seeding methods. And you'll see why when I show you the seeds, because woo, there's a lot. As far as I've seen, it, it doesn't really grow much in Western Canada. But if you're watching and you live in South America, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this plant. Is it a super weed? Is it extremely annoying and invasive? Do you rip it out of the ground as soon as you see it? I want to know. Blue Fissilis likes full sun to partial sun. Uh, I recommend partial sun if you're going to grow it and you're worried about vigorous growth because it grows so easily and self-seeds so easily, maybe try a partial sunspot first or a pot like I did because I was purely curious about this plant when I got the seeds. Some people really don't like the way that it looks when it gets really strong and bushy. Like this one's super lanky. At the end of my season it's dropped quite a few leaves and flowers and seed pods, but typically in the wild or if it's planted in the ground or volunteer growth, it gets quite large, it gets really bushy, and people actually complain because the cool thing about this plant are the papery seed pods. And if it gets really bushy, you can't even really see them and it just looks like a thick, uh, unruly bush. Some people don't like that about this plant. Blue Fissilis is in the Solanaceae family or the Nightshade family. Enormous, diverse family. I'm gonna just narrow right down into the genus Fissilis. Okay, still very large, but a few things to note. Have you ever heard anybody say ground cherries? Ground cherries is like a loose umbrella term for the edible plants in this genus. Okay? The two biggest ones that people know about are tomatillos, uh, that would be Fissilis philadelphica, and cape gooseberries, which are Latin Fissilis peruviana. And then there's the inedible ones that have toxic components. Probably the most popular would be Fissilis alkakengi or the Chinese lantern plant. Beautiful plant to grow for the fall season if you have mild falls. And blue Fissilis. Blue Fissilis is just one of those plants that's highly controversial in its edibility depending on who you ask, where they come from, their traditions, etc. You'll talk to people, and if they know about it, they'll either consider it highly toxic or very medicinal. <laughs> and you know, it's an interesting one to talk about because its appearance is very misleading. It looks like a tomatillo or a gooseberry, for sure. Same family, right? And a lot of people don't know about this plant. Kind of why I wanted to do a plant speak on it. It is believed to be originally cultivated in Western South America, uh, specifically Peru, hence the common name Apple of Peru. Over there, it's used as a very strong medicine for all kinds of ailments. Like, I don't know if they're just gutsier over there, wiser perhaps. In North America, it's considered highly toxic. General consensus is do not consume. I'm with a group of thinkers that consider it toxic and inedible. All right, let's just make that known. I have read about some vague, questionable accounts of livestock in Australia finding some wild blue fissilis growing, eating it, and being poisoned. Yikes. I don't know if that story is true. There's not a lot to find about blue fissilis uh, on the World Wide Web that can be trusted. But, interesting nonetheless. Let's get into the physical properties of this plant. Here's a little side video of me pulling out the actual plant because I want you to see this root system. Really cool. Check it out. Ooh. One plant from a single seed can grow up to a meter high, give or take. This guy's really little, okay? This is not a typical blue fissilis. I want you to know that. Um, I think it may have been forced to go to seed really quick because we had so many heat spells this summer where I live. The stems are tomato-like in appearance. 
okay? Just a little thicker in circumference and they don't have that smell. They don't have that tomato smell or the little trichome hairs. The leaves are ovate in shape and they're toothed at the edges. This is really cool. From seedling stage onward, and I photographed this, the leaves, for me, had these, all of a sudden, teeny little tiny raised black dots. And so, of course, my first time growing it, I'm thinking, oh no, a pest. There's a pest on my physalis. And Upon further research and reading, turns out that's totally normal, and a lot of people think that. So if you get these little black dots on your foliage, that's normal. The really cool thing about it, though, is that some people don't get any. It just doesn't happen to their plant at all. What? That's where I kind of start hypothesizing, like, is this because of different levels of toxic components? Are some plants more toxic than others? How do you know? Very interesting. Why would some express this genetic trait and some wouldn't? I am unable to find any research-based evidence about what this means. If you have any more information, I would love to learn more about that plant characteristic. The flowers are very unique. I don't have any specifically in full bloom open right now, but it's also not a sunny day for me. There are some emerging from their calyxes. Here's one of the blooms just emerging from the cool papery purple and green calyx. This was an exciting phase. My first bloom. I was like, oh. These flowers are bell-shaped and about five centimeters across. Occasionally, you will get an all-white bloom, but usually it's a pale blue or violet with a white center. And then, of course, you have that little pollinator runway design in there. It's in here! Come and get it! The flowers only open for about a few hours a day, and then they close up again. That's also a really special thing to look out for. And they are said to have this sort of musky, strong scent. I haven't noticed on my flowers. So there's another thing that's intriguing about it because the shoe fly plant name actually comes from the smell. A lot of people say that it acts as a natural insecticide, specifically against white fly. This strong smell is supposedly supposed to aid in that shoe fly aspect. My favorite thing about this plant and a very defining characteristic of this plant, if you ask me, almost the main reason to grow it are these papery calyxes. Tomatillos and gooseberries, they have these too, right? But here's a few defining characteristics, specifically on blue physalis, that you can look for. The actual lobes of the calyx on a blue physalis are much more pronounced than others like the edible gooseberry and the tomatillo. See how the calyx on this tomatillo is like a single bladder-like structure versus the very indented specific lobes of the blue physalis. That's one specific difference. The other one is this. Once the flower dries up, it'll fall off and you're left with this papery seed pod that contains a fruit literally bursting with seeds. Check this out, okay? Oh, it's already falling out. It's all dried, see? Here's this little fruit and barely touching it, papery full of seeds, hence its ability to so easily self-seed. These seeds have quite a tough coat, so you can sow them in the fall if you are trying to uh, get them to germinate in early spring, but like I said, vigorous spreaders, very easily self-sown, so you probably don't need to do that. If you have them in your garden, they will self-seed all on their own. I just love how these seed pods look, their papery appearance. And I have read that some people theorize that the papery seed pods uh, resemble small wasp nests. And that kind of contributes to their bug repelling properties. I like that idea, that's kind of cool. Of course this fruit is not edible. And some people don't even like handling it because of its toxicity. Some people would wash their hands after doing this or wear gloves when they're handling it. Because it's said to be such a great uh, insecticide naturally against whitefly, I'm going to try this next season, but if I take my pot and put it near my brassica vegetables, that may be a great companion planting uh, experiment to see if it keeps whitefly away from your beloved brassicas. Now, you'd have to be aware and cautious about the self-seeding aspect because it might get out of control, but it could be worth a try. So, after all this information, what are your thoughts? 
Worth it? Gonna grow it? Definitely not? Not interested? Why would you do a plant speak on this? <laughs> Use it as a fly repellent. Not worth your time? Come on, any plant's worth your time. Thanks for watching Plant Speak.